Take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more, oh, how sweet trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking and rest. <coughs> Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. Trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You see, you'd sing that song out loud if you really believed it or if it really was real in your life. Man, I was just singing that, and I said, man, how many times have we proved the Lord over and over, my wife and I in our ministry? Over and over. And uh, he proved himself to be real to us. If people, uh, I mean, you say, well, you're supposed to believe he's real. Yeah, but have you ever seen him work in your life and do things that, hey, look, we've had many miracles done in our life. My, my wife's life and uh, with amongst our kids and stuff and when and people that we've seen saved. I mean, when my wife and I got saved, um, we were praying for my sisters and brother to get saved and her brother and sister to get saved and, and my mom and dad to get saved and so forth. And it was a long time of prayer. But we all of a sudden, the Lord just opened up the windows of heaven in the area of salvation. We saw 40 nieces and nephews saved within a 10-year period, and all my sisters, my brother, my mom, and dad. Amen. And so, uh, yeah, I said, I'd say that's the greatest miracle I know in my life because we'll get to see them again. I was thinking about that on the way. I was crying on the way to church today, and I thinking about all the people you get to see again. They're not dead. They're just waiting on the shores of heaven so you can reunite with them. They're not dead. And they're, they're with the Lord right now. And so praise the Lord. And I, I'm looking forward to that. I look forward to more and more as every day goes by. Amen. Really, I do. Um, this whole world has nothing for me. And, uh, and it should have nothing for you, really. And you need to protect yourself from from uh, this old world because it's going to want to try bring you down. And yes, the devil's going to want to bring you down. And your flesh is going to get enticed and uh, tempted by this the devil in this world and and uh, be, be taken. Don't let it happen. Just don't let it happen. Amen. And and if you find yourself uh, wandering in your heart away from the Lord, you get on your face and ask God to forgive you and, and uh, confess it to Him. And get right Amen. and uh, and get back into the fight again. And get back. And like Brother Dick Geckler said last night, just we need to be in the fight. Amen. We need to be in the battle. Stay in there. You're soldiers for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Every one of you. There's some soldiers that have fallen that we know. And, uh, man, I mean, I can't even name in two hands how many preachers I know fallen and are no longer fighting for the Lord. And uh, I, I know a preacher. I don't know if you know him. I can't remember his name right offhand, but I remember he was a drug dealer when he, before he got saved. Lived for the Lord for about 10 years and went back to dealing drugs. I, can't, I couldn't imagine that no, after you preach for 10 years. And, no, so, and he left his wife and everything, wife heartbroken, just, just horrible, horrible. And uh, don't let that kind of stuff happen to you. And you fight it. Fight it. 
And uh, God will help you if you just if you get hold of Him and say, Lord, I need help. Amen. Help me. And, all, and every Christian that's any, been around any length of time, they know they had to do stuff like that. You call out to the Lord. Amen. Amen. So why are you saying, oh, that song, that song we just sang, uh, prove him. Yes. Amen. He tells us to prove him. That's a good song for mission conference too, by the way. Yes. Prove him. Give to the Lord. And let's see, let's see if he will not give back. Right. Prove him. Amen. He wants to be proved. Amen. He's waiting for you to prove him. <laughs> He's begging you to prove him, so to say. He just wants to be proved. So you wonder why? Because he knows your faith will grow. He knows that you'll be excited about it. You'll serve him more. You'll be stronger. A lot of things happen. Man, I'm just telling you. Well, why don't we go ahead and pray right now? Our, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We just ask you to help us. Lord, I pray. We need your help. As always, Lord, this wor world is waxing worse and worse. I was talking to Elijah on the way to church today. Lord, how, how wicked this world's getting. And God, and they want to take the young people down, 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 down as far as they can take them. And Lord, we just, it's hard to trust uh, folks in this world that live just in this world, that live for the things of this world and serve Satan and have a whole, whole bad spirit. And Lord, I know we need a region for Christ, but Lord, help protect these young ones. This devil is slick. And uh, I like what Les Roloff said. He calls him smutty foot. And Lord, that's what he is. He's split hoof. And he needs to be bound, Lord, even tonight as we hear the preaching so we can learn. And Lord, we pray the hordes of hell will have no effect on the service. God, bind the hordes of hell even now and give us victory, Lord, to this day. And God, and I pray that you'll get glory from it. In Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. All right, Psalm 277. <clears throat> 277, we'll sing all four verses of Only Trust Him. Amen. 277. <clears throat> Here we go. Every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he save you he will save you now yes Jesus that leads you into rest believe in him without delay and you are fully blessed only trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now come then and join this holy band and on to glory go to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now you know what's interesting Amen. if you read in the old testament it talks about uh, israel being saved people of god being saved 
But you know what? And they'll say, see, you have to be saved by works. But that's not always talking about salvation of their souls. He's talking about being saved from the enemy. And, uh, I mean, you read it. <laughs> you know, people ought to put things in context. And um, I'm just telling you, we got, we're mixed up in Christianity today. I'm not talking uh, our church, but people, Christians, individuals, they get mixed up. And they, I mean, I, we get attacked on a regular basis on our Bible study site about believing that you're saved, once saved, always saved. I believe that with my whole heart. Why wouldn't it be that way? Jesus isn't weak. God isn't a liar. Why would he give us eternal life if it wasn't eternal life? Why didn't he say, I'll give you temporal life until you make it to the end, then it'll be eternal life? How come he doesn't say that? He says, he tell, he says you, hey, what does John 3.16 say? Huh? What kind of life are you going to get when he says that at the end? Everlasting life. Well, how long is everlasting? So why didn't he say temporal life until you, you know, until you make it all the way without a mistake? Because you know what? God knows us better than that. Huh? He knows that we have we can we can sin even in the uh, in, even in our Christian yep. state, amen. Right. And uh, just because you're saved and the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you're saved and the blood of Christ is on you, does not make you exempt from making mistakes, <laughs> from sinning against God. And uh, we're still sinners. We got that old flesh. We still fight it. You know, those same people who, who uh, say that you, you, you'll you lose your salvation will talk about your flesh. And uh, they will say your flesh, you, you battle the flesh. Everybody knows you battle the flesh. The Bible tells you to, to uh, put on the new man, uh, put off the old man. And why is God telling us that? Because, see, there's an old man that still wants to fight for you. <laughs> and uh, he, wants you to, he wants you to go do what you used to do. Don't do what you used to do. Go on and do something new with the Christ. Amen. Walk a good life. Walk a right life. And Brother Geckler, I don't say it the way he says it, but he's right. Uh, this life is worth living in Christ. It really is. And uh, sometimes you get down. Sometimes you can get discouraged and stuff. But you know what? It's nothing like it was when you're lost. When you're lost, you seem to be mad all the time and discouraged all the time and sad all the time and looking for something all the time. And, <laughs> you know, it's a bunch of a bunch of junk the world had to offer you that didn't satisfy you. You know that. And so I'm not telling you a new story. <laughs> hmm? Amen. Yeah, we're going to bring up the Basinus kids. They'll sing one song. Then it'll be Brother, uh, I was going to say what I called you today, Brother Hopgood and, or Jump. What would you say? Jump well. Brother Hopgood or Brother Jump well, you can, whatever. Now, you said that's a Scandinavian name? It's Scottish. Scottish. Hopgood is not good English. Hopgood is not good English. It should be Hop well. Hop well. Or jump well. Is that what you said? Jump well. Jump well. Skip. We're gonna call him. We're gonna call him Skippy. <laughs> hey, Skippy. <laughs> Brother Skippy. No. Hoppy. Hoppy. All right. Where's the kids? Where's the kids? We gave you enough time. I mean, we're joking up here, amen. <laughs> and then just, just come on. You come up here, and you can show that first. Come up and preach. Do whatever you want. Whatever order. The Lord leads. Yes, sir. How long is that? Half hour? No. <laughs> yes. That's short. There you go. That's fine. <laughs> and we'll probably have to move. So you might have to move when he shows that so you can see what he has. Lately I've been looking back along these winding roads to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than I Cliche. No other words to tell you than to say God's been good in my life I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams As I go to sleep each night And though I had my share of hard times By my side he's always stood through it all God's been good 
times we played and I can see him. I've cried some bitter tears, but I felt his arms around me as I faced my darkest fear. I've had more gains than losses, and I know more joy than her as his grace fell down upon me. Undeserved, God's been good in my life. Blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. And though I had my share of hard times, by my side he's always stood. Through it all, God's been good. God has been my father, my savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and his love will be my end. And I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is. But the best way I can say it is this. God's been good in my life. I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. And though I had my share of hard times, by my side he's always stood. Through it all, God's been good. Though I've had my share of hard times, by my side he's always stood. Through it all. God's been good. Just want to let you know I've gotten my cards, so if you want to look those over, oh, yeah. um, that's this format. For our volunteers, uh, we leave this part blank, and we have them.
sign it, and I tell them, make sure you put your phone number, because uh, though we can't put the church name on it, you are the church, and so your phone number becomes the contact for your church. And so uh, that's how you get around that loophole, that's that loophole, not the loophole in the law. And so we're allowed to use these, to pass these out. And so uh, as we get our prospects, then uh, we can leave that with them. And if they want to get picked up for church, or if uh, while we're talking to them on another aspect, uh, if they give us permission and give us their contact information, then uh, that technically uh, gives the, us an invitation to come on base to go see them. And so that helps us get through visita uh, get through the visitor center when they, uh, because they quiz you at the visitor center why you want to get on base, and they will call somebody to uh, find out how you, uh, 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 find out if, you, if they want you to come. Mm -hmm. And so they can stop you from getting on base if they can't get a hold of them or, you know, and you've got two or three visits, you're not going to get on base. So another thing that we do is a visitation fellowship, and we'll have a family on base be uh, given open house and then everybody goes over their house, and so we get through We get through the visitor center that way. And then from there, we get a little finger food and devotion, and then go out from there. And uh, and then on top of that, if we see somebody or, and talk to them, and we can invite them back to the fellowship, and they can meet all the military families every time. <coughs> so it, it does a lot of stuff like one, two, three. So uh, just something to think about. Are you ready? Okay. Sorry, guys, about this. Okay. Not that we have never had a problem before. No worries. He did pray that the devil would be put out, so it's all our fault now. It is. <laughs> What are we on right now? We're on HD. 
Sixteen. That's what you wanna be on. Okay. Hey, turn that light on again. Thank you. Turn it off again. I gotta see where I'm at here. [noise] Okay. Four. Well, you can come to my house. Okay. [noise] Can you finish it? Mm. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. You want me to do it while you're doing something else? Okay. Um Oh, I can do that. Up to you. Uh, actually I can do it, there's another way to do it. Woah, what's Thomas doing? Is that volume? Yeah, yeah, turn it up. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah? Okay, cool. Can you do it by voice? Oh, Thomas? Yeah. I can click on the button. Yeah, it's coming out of my coin box. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's coming out of my coin box. Yeah. Um It's on the green side, basically. That's, that's a green box. Oh, green box. Okay. Cool. Then we have like a temperature. Put it on top of the On the top. Okay. It's gonna take some time, I'm just gonna Oh, okay. I see. I see. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's ready. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Um Yeah, uh I got this thing here. Um, it's just gonna take a little bit. What do you mean? Just kinda wiggle the top of it. Oh, um there we go. Looks great. [noise] I think that's prolly fine. Looks great. Oh, Bethany watched it. That's gonna take some time, I don't think. [noise] Oh, okay. Cool. I guess it's not Cinderella's fault. [laughs] [noise] Oh, that's their first movie right? Oh, really? Mhm. Yeah, so I thought it was gonna be really good. Oh, it's gonna be really good. Well, it's gonna be really good. [laughs] Can you guys not yell? Can you guys not yell? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry [laughs] Sorry, you you go ahead. [noise] I'm I'm like the ghost of Wenny. Just kidding. Can you do your voice or something? Can you do her voice? Oh, I need to talk to her. Yeah, I know. I need to talk to her. Like, Thank you. 
Alrighty, you can go back to your seats before Brother Hopgood comes up here. I didn't know what he was going to show in that video. See, that's that's my hometown. Yeah, well, that's Tacoma. That's out, that's outside Tacoma there. Uh, there's Stillicum, Tacoma, Lakewood. 
And, uh, man, I did a lot of construction in those areas. I did construction on uh, Fort, Fort Lewis when it was called Fort Lewis. And um, I did a lot of work for the government there. I'd go in there and fix the barracks. I fixed the government housing they had because things happened, <laughs> like holes in the walls and things busted up, and I had to go in and fix it. But there were some friends of mine that were in those pictures that were really good friends, like Bill Sapp. Now, Bill Sapp. Yeah, he he uh, yeah he he passed away. He had a he had an adult group a group home. He was about my age when he passed. So, uh, but uh, and his wife uh, Reva and and uh, Reva and um, and uh, the people that he had there in their home. We my wife worked in their home for him, and and then Brother Fountain was in there. Several pictures of Brother Fountain, and uh, Brother Jackson was in there. Um, he he's a friend of mine. Uh, I can't believe it. I was looking at them going, wow, look at all those people I know. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's a blessing. And it's good that they're, and well, of course, that's a military uh, church. There are a lot of military in that church. That's where James went to church there. And I got to preach there when Brother Fountain, my uh, brother, you know, old Brother Fountain and Brother Bramblet were there. And they let me preach. And uh, so, a blessing, man. It's, uh, you might even think about this, you know, you ought to pray about it. If uh, this would be something you want to do, military need to be reached. I mean, when, when I was staying on the military base, when James was up there, I stayed there for a couple of weeks. Man, it, MPs were at people, someone's door every day because someone was doing something stupid. So they need to be reached, just like the civilians need to be reached, but they need to be reached, man, because it's, it's a hard thing to be in the military, you know. Uh, the mental issues and it does it, it mentally drains you and, and and wears on you and uh and some of the things he was talking about uh being a military children being abused and and separated from dad for a long period of time or mom and so forth it's true all that stuff and the abuse that goes on especially they come back and they the, the soldier don't know how to deal with the family a lot of times i i'm i was inside so i understand and um and, um, you know, my dad wasn't the same. My grandma used to say, he's not the same, not the same boy that he sent to war. Right. So she used to say that all the time. He's not the same person. Who is this guy, you know? Because war got to him, and, right. you know, he got, he got wounded three t different times. And my dad did. He had more scars on him than, man, than he had skin. <laughs> and, uh, but the, there was a lot of mental issues that he had to face. And they didn't do it back in his day. They didn't deal with it like they do today. But they didn't have guys coming in preaching the gospel either, it seemed like, because he didn't hear the gospel until I preached it to him when he was 76. Well, so. One thing I could add. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that people ask me is why things are different like yeah. they are today. And I tell them, uh, back in World War II, they dealt with it with morphine and right. liquor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Vietnam, they dealt with it with heroin right. and liquor. Right. And, and, uh, and now they deal with it with Prozac. Right. Yeah. And when people come off of Prozac, they, yeah. if they're not faithful on their medicine, yeah, they can become depressed and violent. And, yeah, mm -hmm, and all that stuff. So, but we're going to give you some time here. Like I tell people, no screaming, no squalling, and no carrying on. Okay. But uh, some churches don't listen to that anyway. So. You get into an Indian church, and uh, they'll just stand up and walk around, do everything. They'll cut up and just go everywhere. And, just, and uh, it, you just get used to it and just go on, you know. And, yeah, <laughs> something like that, isn't it? I, uh, uh, a couple of things, just personal things. Uh, back in 2015... I uh, caught a flu while I was over in Wisconsin, and I came back. Well, actually, I caught it at the airport coming through um, the uh, Chicago airport, and uh, I was down sick for about eight weeks, and my, thr my throat, I just had laryngitis for like uh, months. And uh, finally, uh, what you hear now, I have to preach over the top of that, but my family does not let me sing anymore 
So when I mouth the words, you might not hear. You, pre preacher was saying, it, you, you need to sing like it. And I said, I, I wish I could. <laughs> but I have to save my voice to preach. And then when I do preach, I preach over the top of my hoarseness. And so um, a good day's preaching will, will uh, I'll have to rest a little bit and watch the voice. Of course, I'm 60 this year, and so it's starting to show up on me. It, yeah. Uh, I, I keep trying to figure out how old he really is, but uh, it, I, I found out he was, he's about 25 years old. It, at least that's what the doctors keep telling him. So, <laughs> But uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and preach to you and to be with you in this conference. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I'm, my girls are, have been willing to stay home and be under my roof and under our care. And uh, I think that's biblical. And uh, we found a college that uh, fits right into our homeschool uh, philosophy. And so we were able to homeschool through doctorate. And so <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, once the bachelor's courses were uh, workbook. And uh, then the, uh, the master's degree and the doctorate degree uh, then get into uh, uh, discs and lectures. And so you don't even have to go online. And uh, the only thing they need to do is uh, call a professor once in a while and, and find out what to do. And then uh, the, but the big thing is uh, you can get, I did, I turned it on. Oh, well, I'm not a wanderer, so this one's picking up okay. And if all else fails, uh, you better watch it because I preach. So I'll just leave it as that. But um, the, the, the thing is that, um, uh, because of that, uh, we're able to uh, keep the cost down, and uh, we don't have a tuition. So I'm not paying $4,000 right. every 18, uh, 36 months, or yeah, I think it's 36 months, uh, uh, 36 weeks. Uh, it, right. You can imagine paying $4,000 every 36 weeks. That's, that's what it is to go to West, West Coast and other places like that. And uh, uh, we, we can do all of college for $2,000. But we have to buy our books and do all the mailing and do all the other costs that come with that and then, you know, uh, home office and all of that that goes into that. So uh, we, we have a project, an education project. I'm raising uh, spending money for uh, the books. And so if you uh, would uh, think about what you might do to uh, put something in the, the, the cans I got there to, to take home to them, um, even just a couple dollars here and there it helps. And it encourages them because uh, they know that I'm at least keeping keeping everybody abreast of what's going on. So it's a it's a blessing if you can help us with that. Yeah. Um, tonight I'm dealing with the prodigal son, and I uh, when I first come up with this sermon, it was one of those aha moments because uh, for me, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. But the idea is that we're dealing with uh, a prodigal. Now, I do want to start off by saying we have a lot of noble, good Christians in, in, and, and sometimes non-Christians. You have some people that are in good Catholic families. They were raised, you know, with character and uh, they're, you know, they're good people. Right. And, uh, uh, but for the most part, we have over four million in our army and in our, in, in our services. And so uh, for the most part, uh, as Pastor mentioned, that there, there are major problems, major character problems, major flesh problems, and all sorts of things that go on. And so uh, I've preached messages like this before, and I've had people come up to me and say, but my son's not like that, or I know people that aren't like that, you know, and I, I want to be careful in that because I, I don't want to misrepresent and uh, have a universal statement that deals with everybody and just say everybody's in this boat. They're not. Right. But for the most part, most young men and most young people, uh, men and women in the military, um, have uh, what goes on in the military with what we think of with all of the carousing and everything else. And I'll be dealing with that also. So take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, book of Luke, chapter 15. And I'll start reading. I hope you can catch up with me. Verse 11. And it says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. 
and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. That was where it really hit me, is this joining stuff. And he sent him into the fields, into his fields to feed swine. He would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you. And as the pastor said last night about needing you, uh, that is so, so, so sure and so needed. And Lord, we are dust. And as dust, we know our place before thee. And these men that have been in the ministry for so many years know what it's like to uh, have you do such great things as pastor mentioned. And we're so grateful for it. I pray, Father, that you would indeed use us, and I thank you for giving us the opportunity to do so. And Lord, we love you and thank you. Thank you for these people that have come out on a Tuesday night and are willing to, to bear the burden of, of listening to missions and thinking about missions and all that it goes into. And I pray, Father, to reward their faith for it. And those that did not come for some reason or other, that, Lord, that you would woo them and help them and Lord, give them something that, uh, as they're missing this, Lord, that they might still have a, a united f heart in this church for all the missions that they support. And Lord, that you bless all the preaching, even now tonight. And I ask for your blessings and that you'd walk amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, when you look at a parable, one thing I want you to keep in mind, none of the parables in the Bible are fantastical. Every single parable is a real-life situation that could have happened on earth at any time in history and most likely has been repeated a number of times. How many times could it be that we can say we've seen uh, this prodigal repeated in people's lives over and over and over again and you get older people says yeah I was like that I did that and I went through that and right. and they, they're, they're ashamed of it and they hurt for it but they, they thank God they got through it but there are some that don't right. and the, the key to remember is that no matter what we look at in the Bible uh, as Jesus preaches none of it's a fable like the Mormon doctrines there, none of our what God does for us and has done for us in our Bible is 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 fantastical. It's all truth. Right, right. And the history of these things and the the, the fact that uh, here's an agricultural society that how many would associate with that and and know about famine and know about problems and know about the difficulty with with dealing with uh, children like this. You know, in history, uh, Abraham, after Sarah died, got remarried. And when he did, he had children by her. And that's where the Midianites come from and other headaches the Jews had. Uh, but the problem, the, the thing is that uh, when we look at what's going on in this, in this age group, and we see this man wanting these things and, and uh, wanting his inheritance. This was a normal function. This was not abnormal. Uh, now, there was some things that are wrong with this. But when you think of back when Abraham did what he did, uh, when those people were grown, he sent those sons off with gifts. And then he gave all to Isaac. And... Uh, interestingly enough, Jacob was 15 years old before Abraham died. He, they were all in a big camp. And uh, Abraham was grandpa and to Jacob. And he knew his grandfather. And so just some side thoughts for you to think about. But here's a young man that's impatient and arrogant. Doesn't that label a lot of our society today? Now, he wanted his now, and he knew just what he wanted to do with it. 
This is what I call the post-high school age. Many think they know everything, or at least the, impo the important things to them. There's this mix going on in their era of our families and family life. There's the parents wanting the empty nest. You know that's unbiblical? You should want your children and give them an open door to stay home and grow up until they're 25, 26 years old, where they can really think and really get the right mate and really do the right things. But in our society, there's this general acceptance that once you're 18 and graduate, you move out and you're gone and you're on your own. The problem is young person in this situation is still too young to make all the life-changing decisions that they need to make in their life. Now, for you and I, there are major decisions. There's seven major decisions in a, in a person's life that are life-changing. One is salvation. Two is church affiliation. Three is your schooling. Four is your career. Five is where you live. Six is who you will marry. And seven is how many children you have. Now, some people think, oh, you know, it, when you get that third child in the house, it changes everything. It changes everything. And any misstep in any of these will take years to repair, not to mention the accidents, the injuries, the jail time, the gambling, the chasing the get-rich-quick schemes, drugs, alcohol, loose living. Any of that can get, destroy any one of these. Now, Scripture makes the distinction between youth and adult at about 21, 20, uh, 20 to 21 years of age. Right. Right. During the Korean War, auto autopsies were coming back and were done on casualties. And they found that younger men in the brain, the nerves that connect the right and left side of lobes of the brain, were not fully developed in 17 and 18-year-old men. It's not until you're in your mid-twenties that you're all fully there upstairs. <laughs> and so you think about this. We're expecting these people with these kind of physical changes and physical things to make all these life-changing decisions. How many kids get married at 18 to 20 years of age yeah. when they're not ready? Right. And half of that is just all flesh anyway. And the problem here is they're not with it all upstairs. They're not with it in their heart. And they're expected to make all these decisions. And then they go off to war. You know what we're doing? We're sending children into war. Yeah. Now, when things go wrong, we ask them, you know, like, you know, when they're young, what are you going to do with your life? And I go, well, I don't know. And they don't. And sometimes, you know, they put on the face you know, and they get the fake it till you make it and the hope. And that's why these people go off. And when things go wrong, they get discouraged and it's hard to face and it's hard to face anyone. And so they don't want to come back to church. Right. They don't want to, the shame drives them away. And who knows where they're going to end up? Amen. Some want college. Now, you probably heard of the fraternity houses. You know, every year freshmen die of binge drinking. These 17 and 18 year old kids, they die of binge. And, you, and the thing is about it, when they get in the military, they get money to burn. Right. And so they party, party, party. And so in verse 13, it says riotous living. Right. It's riotous living. It's just exactly what this man did. But what happened to this fella? The money ran out. The money ran out. And so he began to be in want. You ever been in want? You ever been to the place where you're trying to figure out whether you're going to put the money in the gas tank or the money into feeding the baby? You ever had one of those weeks? That's want. I've had it where I've been wanting to know what's going to happen. I'm sitting there in a phone booth at 2 in the morning on a dead street trying to figure out where I'm going to sleep tonight. I've been there. I know what it's like like this. I've been between parents where I've had a, a, a drunk for a stepmother and a mother that was insane and not knowing which home I was going to try to go to or whether I should just sleep on the street tonight. And so these kids, they get into want. You know, when you get into want, you have three choices mainly. One, you do what you think best. Now that's arrogant and full of pride. But you know it is not what you should do. 
But two, you do what you're forced to do. You ever have to do something that you're forced to do? You know, that's, you never make the right decision when you're in that situation. You always go from bad to worse. And then thirdly, you do what's right. But you see, that involves God and his choices for your life. And unless that happens, you're not going to make it. Now, in verse 15, at first glance, this kid is self-assertive, full of industry, goes and gets a job. Everybody thinks, oh, he's okay, he's got a job. But you know, underlyingly, this guy got himself in this fix, and he was willing to work, but he was persistent still with his own way. He's still full of pride. And that's where many find themselves, and they go uh, looking for somebody to join. And you know who they join? Uncle Sam. That's who they go join. They go find Uncle Sam, and they go to work for Uncle Sam. Now, as I said, there's many good men in the military, and it's, uh, it's the, the problem is a lot of these guys, when they're saved, they go in the military, they put it under the rug. And they leave it under the rug until they get out of the military. And then maybe they recover their life, and maybe they don't. And as I said the other night, I asked a sergeant about where he goes. And after eight years, you figure he might have gone to church three or four times. But in verse 16, this young man went from bad to worse. And in verse 16, he's, he's thinking about what's going wrong, and he's thinking about his belly. And he's thinking about his sorrows, and he's thinking about his problems. But then in verse 17, he gets this aha moment. Have you ever had an aha, aha moment to where you think, man, you know, like the commercial, oh, I should have had a V8, right. you know? But for the rest of us, it's like, man, I should have done this or I should have done that. And it's at this point that this young man has to make some decisions. He starts thinking about home. You know, when there's love at home and things are going uh, at home and people start to have an idea of some place to go home to. There's a lot of people who don't have that. But just maybe, just maybe, dad loves me enough to where he forgive me. And so this young man took this time and he was willing to come to himself. Now, I'm trying to help others come to himself and tonight, I don't know, some of you you know, it's amazing how kids get uh, sideways with their parents. They get sideways with God, and they start thinking twice about what they're going to do. And bless God, when I graduate, I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to get out of this mess. Forget this schooling. Forget this church. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to have my life back. And they go do what they want to do, and they think that they're right, and they find themselves just playing the fool. Yeah. And then they're game for the devil, and they just start get sucked in and things that they thought were wrong and the things that they were preaching it wrong and things they were singing about up here about wrong what are they doing now five years later Amen. they're sitting behind a bar half stoned yep. half drunk yep. trying to figure out what they're going to do afraid to go home ashamed to go home they don't have enough money to eat tomorrow they're they're they don't have a job they don't know how to work right. and so they go in the military well, the military is getting to the point now where they, they do something about those kind of people. But here, this young man came to a point of repentance. Repentance. He knew something was wrong, and he started to figure out what was wrong. But he came to that point, how? Because he says to himself, now I've sinned against the world. Did he say that? What does he say? I've sinned against heaven. All of a sudden, you see God's in the picture. And he starts thinking twice about God. And he starts thinking that God's going to be part of my life now, and I'm going to get something right. And so he gets right with God. So somewhere in the middle of this, with all his rehearsal, and he, fix, he comes up with this confession. And he's driven by circumstances, and he gets to that point where he has this great need, but it drives him to the point where he is finished with being willing to live under the bridge. You know, he comes out from under the bridge and said, man, I'm going home. Yeah. I'm going home. 
And whatever that was deterring him from this, he now is he's changing the way he's doing things. And he said, I've sinned against heaven. And he says, I'm no more worthy. I'm no more worthy. How about you? Has there been a time in your life that you knew that you were not worthy, we're just dust, and that we're not God, we're not in charge of our lives, we need, we're, we're not the best leader of our own selves? You, you've got to make that decision. But when he went home, if you notice, his dad would not let him finish that confession. He said, bring that son, bring the food, bring the, bring the clothing. This is my son who was dead. Now he's alive. I'm asking you, friend, would you, if you've not crossed that, that line with God, let, let God do something for you today and, and give you that love and give you that hug and give you that kiss and give you new clothes and give you a new name and give you a new heart yeah. and, and give you what you need. You know, I got saved off a gospel track. And uh, I, I had people witness to me, and I had people tell me about Jesus. Uh, first time I'd ever heard a Baptist preacher was over in Germany. And I had a guy on my crew who said, you know, Rog, where are you going to go when you die? I'm sitting in front of a six-pack, and I'm thinking, I got no idea. Here I'm loading nukes on a mountaintop, and we're eight, nine and a half minutes, we're eight and a half minutes from the Russian border, uh, and my crew chief says, we go into a NATO war game, says, you know, Raj, uh, when you see one of them birds take off with a nuke under its belly, you've got eight and a half minutes to live. And uh, I lived with that for three years, that kind of pressure. And I, I know what it's like to be in the military and to deal with these people yeah. and what they're coming from and what they're going to. And I'm asking you if you would think about what you might do to help not just me, but any missionary that you got on the, on the burners wait, that people you want to take on. And what I want you to understand is this. It's incremental. You know, I was sharing with, with Pastor here about, uh, I have a, what I call a 50-50-50 rule. If 25 people, you know, and that's most medium churches, small, smaller churches, will give 50 cents for 50 weeks, you can support a missionary for $50 a month, 50-50-50. And so even a junior church could take on a missionary. And so you've got to think about that, that, that when you have a missionary up here, he represents to, to all the money earners in the church and anybody else that, that has a desire to go out and try to figure out how to get 50 cents a week. Every, every missionary is only an increase of 50 cents a week if you're going to go at, at $50 a month. I, I beg churches just to give me $5 a month. I mean, just back in the old days of the 60s when, you know, missionaries would go everywhere and they'd get $5 a month from all these different churches. That's the way they used to think about it. Now, thank God, they give 25 to to $100 a month. But the thing is that it's, it's your, your God wooing you back into the Father, back into the home, back into to the love of God, and then asking us to be sacrificial to turn around that we might not be like that big brother that I didn't talk about. But he had an older brother. Now, if that older brother really loved that boy, loved his brother, do you think he'd stay home? Don't you think, man, I know what that boy's doing. I'm going to have to go do something about it. Right. But that brother wanted nothing to do with that kid. He didn't want him around the house. He didn't want him in the father's home. He didn't want him. He was a detriment to him, and he was ashamed of him. And so instead of wanting to get these kids in, instead of wanting to get them off the street or out of the military or out of college or to get them to come back and sit in these chairs, instead of doing it, he said, I don't want him here. You know what he did to me? You know what he did to me? And that's the way a lot of people are. And that's why they don't want to come back. That's why they don't want to come in the door. And so we're after them. And, but you and I are both on the other end. I mean, all the things we've done wrong that have hurt people. And yet God says, come home, Amen. come home, come home, Pastor. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, thinking about that, he was uh, talking about these young people. And I agree with him on that, that uh, the Bible says that you're not an adult 
me and you're not an adult till you're about 20, 21 years old. And there's no such thing as teenager in the Bible. And, uh, but here, think about this. You get, you're, you're 18 years old and you go, oh, I'm out of my house. Because, you know, uh, you Americans, they're taught, taught that. When you're 18, you're an adult and you can get out of the house and go on your own and blow your life up. Because <laughs> that's what usually happens. Usually happens. And, but do you know what the Bible says about a man leaving the home? Anybody have an idea? It says, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father, father and mother, and cling to what? His wife. That means a man should probably stay in the home till he's ready to be married. You know, America's got it wrong. American, uh, American general. Uh, churches have it wrong because they do the same thing. Not all churches, but there's churches and, and it's not preached that way. And then they send them off, like you said, to the military. And you got a bunch of kids fighting for us. And instead of saying, you know, we need to put some older people into the military, what they do is they turn the table and say, well, he's 18. If he can fight for us, he should be able to drink. <laughs> that mentality. Uh, well, he should be able to vote, and he should be able to do this, and he should be able to do that. He's not old enough to know what he's doing. <laughs> really, I know I was 18 years old. I didn't know what I was doing at 18. And when he's talking about 25, that's about the time when all of a sudden it sense came to me. And I said, what am I doing? I got married at age 20. And I'm going... What am I doing? I got two kids and a wife, and I'm a mess. <laughs> and I look back, and psh, I'm glad the Lord saved me. <laughs> Amen. Yep. And uh, they put some young people into the military. My dad was 18, I think, going to the military. My father-in-law was 17. And, uh, man, my father-in-law was, uh, was in a camp in Japan during World War II for two years, eating eating raw fish and hot rice every day, morning, noon, and night. That's what he had. When he got out, he would not touch rice. Didn't want anything to do with fish, and you get away from it because, he, I mean, he blew up. My father-in-law never blew up until you mentioned those things or brought them up to him, and he, he was a different man. And I, once, I only had to do it once, and then I realized, I'm not saying that again. <laughs> hmm? I thought he was joking with me, but no, he wasn't joking. And, but he was a kid. He was 17 years old, 18 years old, and he was in prison for two years in Japan. Yeah, that'll mess you up. See, and it's military, and they didn't deal with all that stuff. And uh, they they hold on to that stuff, these men. And uh, it's a mental, it's a, it was a mental punishment that they dealt with. So, but praise the Lord. And we should be praying about whether we should uh, uh, help with this ministry or not. I. I'm encouraged with it. I like I. One of the things is because I've I'm been I've, I lived up there and been around those men and been around soldiers and and uh, all my life. And uh, they they're just well, I went hunting with them, a lot of them. Went hunting. I mean, I was a kid. Went hunting with these guys. Man, they were good hunters. I'm telling you. I sit there. They say, "Look at that!" And I go, "What?" <laughs> and boom! Before I could even see it, they had it dead. Amen. I mean, I'm like, really? And um, so I was, I was a poor excuse of a hunter. <laughs> I'm just telling you, but it was a blessing to be around some of those guys. That really was, and a lot. Of, I've, I was around a lot of Vietnam vets as a kid. So, and I grew up in that area, knew the fort really good. I went in there. I worked for on the commissary. I've been at the Madigan. You know, you showed that in there, and uh, and I was on the base there. Actually, got to witness and stuff. And I know what you're talking about going through the the gate and you get you, you get in or you don't get in and they they scrutinize you they do and you got to have all the proper paperwork even as a civilian you better have the right paperwork where's your license where's your where's your registration i mean they, they scrutinize your car they actually may even search it they searched my car one time yeah they searched my car they told, told my son my son was with me he was in one car i was in another they told him get out of here because i'm searching his car not yours and they made him go away and they wouldn't search my car till he left and I'm like, and I'm thinking like this, what did I do? I'm going away and he'll never find me. I'm not joking. <laughs> and so the MPs, they, they stripped my car <laughs> looking, thinking I had something. I don't know what they thought. I'm an old guy, you know, driving on the base. <laughs> and so uh, I just wanted on base. That's all I wanted. They let me go, though. So it was a blessing. <laughs> and uh, so, but I appreciate that. And that's a good ministry. That would be a good ministry, reaching the military. And always reach in the military, amen. A lot of men go into the military. A lot of women go into the military and reach them for Christ, man. Get under the preaching. And it's funny how many 
when they get saved, get into the ministry. They do. Yeah, they're disciplined for it too. Yeah, they are. I'm the, I, I can't I can't name on two hands the people I know that are were military and now in the ministry. It's just something about it, and uh, build some character in them in the military. Amen. Oh, we're gonna have the girl, the the senior kids come up and sing again. All righty, we'll have you sing again. Then Brother Geckler will come up, and uh, Jeremy, Jer pray for Jeremy. Pray for like, two two prayer requests. One is for Jeremy because he had to leave early because he's got a job interview, and it's an advancement in his in his um, at his work. And they actually called him today to come in. So he has to be there at eight thirty. He's got a. Uh, he told me, preacher, I'll, I'll have to step out early. Um, because I got an interview and it's for a higher position where he's at. And they asked him and they told him that they're tossing his name around for positions. So that's a blessing, encouraging to him. The other one is pray for Brother Porter. He started his chemo yesterday for his brain tumors. Huh? And uh, he, they gave him four to six months to live, but they're hoping that this will help. Then he'll go to my doctor and maybe he'll get some help from him. So pray for him. He started yesterday, and I'm, you can imagine how he's feeling today after the first round of chemo. That's Dave Porter and his wife, Debbie. Amen. So, and uh, he's my age, too. Man, good night, all these things. They only gave him uh, five months to live uh, 15 years ago, and he lived 15 more years, and now they said the tumors have gotten bigger, and they gave him four to six months. And, uh, oh, they gave him five weeks. I'm sorry, not five months, five weeks to live. Now they gave him four to six months to live, and uh, he's going through the chemo again. Maybe it'll help, and, and you know at least put it in remission so he can get help from Rodney to get taken care of. So pray for him, all right? All righty, because he needs it, and so does his wife. She's still got no hip, okay? They took out her hip, and she's been sitting there with infection, needing to be, have a hip put in. And so, all right? What? When I look around and see the blessings on this country, it's plain to see how good the Lord has been. But I hear some people say, put that old black book away. And then I just remind them once again. It's just a book that saved me from damnation. It's just a book that cleansed me from my sin. It's just a book that found in this great nation. And it's our only hope to get her back again. They don't want God's Ten Commandments. They don't like my King James Bible. They don't care to hear what Jesus Christ has done. They speak with such conviction and condemn us with such boldness. But just show the book and then just watch them run. If it's just a book, why are you running? If it's just a book, why get so mad? If it's just a book, why get so nervous? It's just a book that knows every thought you've had. When you open up this book into your heart, it takes a look and it shows you exactly what you are. From the pages there within, it points out your every sin. It discerns thoughts and intents of your heart. It's just, just a, a book that showed me full salvation. It's just a book that ran my title clear. It's just a book that gave to me the victory. It's the King James Bible that I hold so dear. It's just a book that that saved me from damnation. It's just a book that cleansed me from my sin. It's just a book that found in this great nation. And it's our only hope to get her back again. And it's our only hope to get her back again. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I was I was reminded uh, tonight. It's, it's it's amazing. 
uh, about, of course, uh, they have more than one preacher. And uh, the story was told years ago of an old an old time preacher and a young preacher sitting on the platform. They're getting ready to preach, and the young young preacher sitting there, and he's all nervous because he he said, "I had a had a message in my Bible, and I can't find it. I got a message. I had a message, and I can't find it." The old preacher leaned over and he said, "Oh, son," he said, "Don't worry." He says, "Just get up there and open the book and just." Just preach God's word. You'll be all right. And uh, so the, uh, he got up to preach and he grabbed his Bible from the stand, got up there and he opened the Bible and he realized it's not his Bible. It's the old preacher's Bible. And right in the middle of the Bible, there's a message. And he started preaching the message. And boy, he just kept preaching the message. And boy, he did a good job. Sat back down. The old preacher said, hey, you took my, you took my Bible. You took my message. And he said, oh, Sir, don't worry. Just get up there and open the book and preach whatever God lays on your heart. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. I've I've been I've been there. Uh, it wasn't too many too many months ago. I was in church and got up to uh, uh, got up to preach, and I'm thinking I had some notes here somewhere. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find them anywhere. But anyway, uh, if you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn to First Timothy chapter six, if you would. First Timothy chapter six, and read a few verses. Get in the message. And uh, I'm excited about it. I enjoyed the, uh, the prodigal, a uh, story on the prodigal. And I thought, boy, that's so true today, isn't it? it is. And I'm sure it's true in the military. And that's a good point in the, suit, uh, in the, in the world today. And uh, but we see what the answer is. Of course, repentance and turning to God. Amen. Amen. And I'm so thankful for it. If you would, please stand with me tonight. And uh, we'll read a few verses. Uh, if you would, please just follow along. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. It says, But thou, O man of God... Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give, I, I give uh, uh, thee a charge in, in the sight of, of God, who quickeneth, all things, and before Jesus Christ, whom before uh, Pontius Pilate witness a good confession. Verse 14 says that thou keep uh, keep this commandment without spot, un, uh, unrebukable, until uh, the, the, the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is in time he shall show uh, who is and bless and, uh, and, and, be, and the blessed, the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, yeah. who only hath a immortal dwelling in the, right, in, the, in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom, to whom be honor and power uh, uh, everlasting. Amen. Amen. Verse 17 says, Charge them that are rich in, in this world, that, ye, uh, that they be not uh, high-minded, nor trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things. Notice these last two words, to enjoy. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, help me tonight. I need your help, Lord. I always need your help. I need it more today than ever before. Lord, I want to be a help, a blessing. Thank you for this church. Thank you for, uh, Lord, uh, the preacher here and, Lord, his family and Lord, I pray that we would uh, uh, take some time tonight to just think on what we have and rejoice in it. Yeah. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, uh, Lord, um, it's, a, it's a week night and, we're, and many are tired, weary. Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, we something be said to be a help. Lord, uh, make the time. Lord, you're uh, reading your word and the preaching of your word. Make it count, I pray, in our hearts. Thank you for what we've heard thus far, Lord, and the challenge that we've heard. And, Lord, I pray now you'd bless bless this time. Use it, I pray. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Some time ago, I, <clears throat> I used this illustration, and I thought it's so so appropriate to many many Christians today a fellow was decided that he was going to sell his house he was tired of it and you know how the world is the world you get something and it's nice and you have it for a while and you want something better you know you say boy there's got to be something better out there you know grass is always greener on the other on the uh, other side of the street well, not except for in this area <laughs> there's no grass green but anyway there's no grass but anyway i showed i showed one of the uh, one of the girls today a picture of our church and she said what's that in front of it it's all green <laughs> i said that's grass i mow we mow grass 
<laughs> you know, the right kind of grass. But anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> the fella decides he's going to sell his house, you know, and he called up the, the realtor and he had the uh, fella come out and said, we're going to sign, uh, list your house. And she went through the property and took all kinds of pictures of it and different pictures and all the different, wrote everything down, you know, and described it, you know, and, and was going to put it on multiple listings and to sell the house. And she, she said, what I'd suggest is if you get a, a this back before the computer, she said, get a, get a multiple listing book and go through there and see if you can find a, a house that you'd be interested in. So he said, well, that's a good idea. So she... Uh, took the listing and posted the listing. And he, one night he, him and his wife are going through the book and they come across this piece of property. And he says, Hey honey, listen to this. Doesn't this sound good? And he goes on and he describes it, how many acres it has and all this it has and all this it has. And he, she says, boy, that does sound really good. Well, we have to check this out. Where, where is it at? Where's it located? And they get down there and they see the address and they both look and said, wait a minute, that's our house. You know what it was? They had what they needed, and they were and and they were looking at it. And guess what? They just didn't realize what they had. Right, right. They just didn't realize what they had. Right. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of areas in life that's the exact same way. You know what people say, and we heard it said before: you'll never know what you have till you don't have it anymore. Right. Can I tell you something? I got news for you. Why don't we? If that be true, and it is true, we all know that's true. But can I tell you, why don't we appreciate what we have, why we do have it? Right. And you know why we don't? Because we don't think about it. We don't realize it. We're not thankful for it. Right. We, don't let, we, don't, we don't say, boy, you know what? I am blessed. I look around and, <clears throat> I'm, I, look, I look around and what God has given me. Amen. And it's not because of me. It's because of his mercy and his goodness, what God has given me. Somebody asked me, how, how, how are you doing? I said, I got news for you. I'm doing better than I deserve. God has been so good to me. I look around what I have, and I realize where it came from, and I'm thankful for it. Amen? Amen. And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about, I said, how can we enjoy our salvation more? I thought, you know what? You're, when you get saved, you have all that you need. Amen? Amen. I'm glad it's not, uh, uh, well, get a little bit here and a little bit there. You know what? When you're saved, as far as eternal life, it's done, and, and, and we have all that we need. Right. Now, it's a wonderful thing because the more we learn what salvation really means, there's much more to it. It's like back in the old days when they went, you went to buy a car. Uh, some of you won't uh, rela uh, relate to this because it's been a lot of years ago. I mean, it was back when I was a kid and my dad, you go down to buy a car. You bought a car, say, for instance, you bought a new pickup truck. Well, guess what? They'd ask you about all the options. They'd say, oh, would you like? Back then, a heater was an option. Right, right. <laughs> Back then, uh, full wheel covers was an option. A radio was an option. You know, all these different options. You could have the car, and then there was all these options or all these things that were added on to it. Right. And I thought, you know what? With our salvation, you know what? When I got saved, I got saved for one reason. I didn't want to burn in hell. You know, I, I get tired of these people saying, well, that, that shallow thinking, you know, you're just, the only reason you got saved is because you didn't want to burn in hell. I got news for you. That's a good enough reason to get saved, man. By the way, they said, well, I was just thinking, I was thinking, and I just, my life was just not glorifying God. Well, I got news for you. My life wasn't glorifying God either, but that's not why I got saved. I got saved because I don't want to spend eternity in hell. Yeah. That's it. That's the only reason I walked that aisle that night. I thought, you know what? I, later on, later on, after I was saved and after there was a change in my heart, I wanted to please God. I wanted to serve God. I wanted to glorify God. But I got news for you. That night I got saved. It wasn't in my mind as I walked down that aisle. I'm going to walk down that aisle and I'm going to get saved to glorify God. Now I walked down the aisle to get saved because I didn't want to burn in hell. Yeah, Some say, oh, that, I got news. You call it whatever you want. I don't care. You know what? I, I got news for you. They say whatever they want. I got saved because I didn't want to burn in hell. I was motiv motivated to trust Christ because I did not want to burn in hell. But you know what? I got the gift. And, the, and by the way, if that's all there was with salvation, that would be enough. Right. But you know what? This is like the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, every year, every year I realize more than what I have in Jesus Christ. You know, I, I look at it like this. People have what they need, but they're not using what they have. Yeah. 
I look at it like this. They don't appreciate what they have, and they're not taking advantage of what God has done. It was bought in the price. It's already been paid for. Right. And you know what? It's right. like having something, and you put it away, and you don't use it, or you don't experience it, or you don't appreciate it. And I was thinking about that. So I thought most Christians do not enjoy their salvation to its fullest extent. Right. There are some... I believe some things that will help you, and I'm going to quickly share them with you tonight, if I could. First of all, a definite acquaintance with the Savior. Say, preacher, what do you mean about that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, we need to get to know Him better. Amen. <laughs> right, right. You know what? Every day with Jesus ought to be sweeter than the day before. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the only way that's going to take place, the only way that's going to take place, uh, the only way that that's going to happen is you learn more about Him. You know what? We read the Bible and we learn more about Jesus. You know what? Get acquainted with him. You know what? The better you get acquainted with someone, the more you love them. Amen. I thought you'd get acquainted with, you know what? It's like, it was almost like some Christians, they met Jesus one night and got saved, but they never, they, they parted ways and, ne and never spent any time together and never got to know each other, you know? They said, oh yeah, he saved me. But basically, he saved you and he, there's a life that, you know, it's amazing. People, I, I come across folks that are saved. They say, well, yeah, I got saved. I said, well, you know, and they haven't grown one bit. They have no desire to grow. It was just like, well, I got saved. I'm going to heaven. You know what? And it's like, that's all there is. Right. I got news for you. They call it the new birth. You know what? New beginning. I mean, it's a new relationship that needs to be, right. that needs to grow. And by the way, the more it grows, the more you enjoy what you have. Amen. Yeah. The Christian life is a life worth living. We need to get acquainted with the Savior. I was thinking in 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 12, it says this, for, uh, for, uh, for, for the uh, for the uh, which cause I do suffer uh, these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I knew I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've uh, committed unto him against that day. Right. Right. You know what? <laughs> you know, no, you know. I say, people, we need to know why we uh, we need to know why we're saved. Amen. We need to know what took place and what happened in our heart. So well, I'm saved. I put my faith and trust in Christ. Uh, a preacher, uh, a preacher, and I were talking about that. You know, the, sometimes they get people get so so nitpicky about this. You know, you need to know the exact moment and the exact date and the exact time. And and I got news for you: if you're saved, if you're saved, you know if you're saved or not. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's been a change as you, you realize that, hey, you, there was a time you, you know, there was a time where you realized you were lost. I had a lady years ago in our church says, I said, uh, said to her, I said, uh, when did you get saved? She said, I've always been saved. Did you ever have anyone like that? I've always been saved. I said, well, what are you counting on then to get you to heaven? Oh, my faith in Jesus Christ. I said, well, when did you get saved then? I've always been saved. Yeah. I got news for you. There has to be a time where you realize you're lost before you can get saved. I say, well, I've always been, I got news for you. It might, you might have been younger. You might have been young, young, a young person when you got saved. But there had to have been a time where you say, hey, you know what? I was lost, and I, I realized I have the penalty of hell, and I, I've turned from my sin. I've turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord to forgive me my sins. Come into my heart and save me. You know what? We need to get uh, acquainted with him. Amen. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I want to get to know him better. Amen? amen. I want to walk with him and talk with him on a regular basis. Amen talking to Elijah today and we're talking about prayer and the importance of prayer and how wonderful thing you know what when no one else when no one else understands or no one else is around there's always Jesus and he's always there Amen. he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother Amen. I thought you know we we see in um, over in uh, Philippians chapter 3 Another verse in verse 10 in uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says that uh, may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. You know what? To be sure about your salvation. You know what? I don't, I don't preach, I don't preach messages to get people to doubt their salvation. I want to preach. You know what? If you're saved, then you need to build upon that which you have. I remember when I was in Bible college, I had so many life-changing messages, uh, I didn't know who I was, you know. <laughs> I thought, boy, you know what, uh, put doubt in your mind. I got news for you. Uh, I, you just need to know, are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? Is it, do you have any doubt? If you have some doubt, get it taken care of, amen? 
I've said this before, and I mean this with all my heart. As much as I enjoy being saved, and I'm so thankful for being saved, if I thought I was not saved tonight, I would get saved. I don't, you know what? I don't really care what I would, what I would sacrifice or what people would think of me. I got news for you. It's more important to me to know that heaven's my home and I'm, I'm a child of God than anything else in this world. I say the most important decision we'll ever, we've ever, anyone will ever make is putting their faith and trust in Christ. Yeah. You know what? To be sure you're saved, you know for sure. I thought, be sincere about your service to, to your church. <laughs> you know, be sincere about your service. You know, I uh, often tell, I would, I would just have, I would, I prefer, I, I would prefer everyone be excited about and get involved in every aspect. But you know what? I said, just be sincere, be honest. I got news for you. If you've been in the ministry very long, you you figure you kind of you don't have everything figured out, but you do have a few things figured out. And I believe God allows us to do that. I really do. I believe He gives us insight to be able to see that. And you know what? You can after a while you can see people. You can see right through them. You know, I always give people the doubt, even if I think, even if I think that what, what, whatever, I always want to give them the doubt. I always give them the benefit of the doubt. I always give them uh, time to, to get things right. But you know what? To s surrender to the service uh, um, and, and, and be sincere about it. You know, just to do that, what you've got to have you, be steadfast in your stand. You know, we got too many Christians who believe one thing today and one th and a different thing tomorrow. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we, I heard, I heard a, uh, Preacher talk, uh, well, it's been some time ago. He said he had one of those Bibles that every other pages was blank. Yeah. And he said he preached and made his message in the blank pages. He said I had to go back later on. He said when I was a young preacher, I was preaching some things that I found out later on wasn't right. And by the way, I'm sure we've all come across a few things we, th we thought wrong. And by the way, I'm big enough to admit if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you know. And I, I got news for you. They, uh, the idea that uh, you need to be, but you need to be steadfast. When you get it settled, then stand on it and be counted on it. Amen. You know what? Quit, waver, quit wavering, like being blown back and forth in the wind. You're being tossed to and fro. You know what the Bible talks about? That what being double-minded man's the one that back and forth, blown, blown back and forth by the wind. I thought, you know what? We need to say, hey, this is what the Bible says, and I'm going to stand on it. Amen. I thought, you know what? Uh, be acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, daily assurance of your salvation. I'm not saying you ought to question your, your salvation every day, but you ought to acknowledge it. You know what? I started this years ago. Every day I thank Jesus for my salvation. I thank God for my salvation. You know what? I, I don't want to go a day without thanking him for saving me. You know, I, I think about, I think about, I think about where I'd be today without the Lord. I think about where I'd be. And, and I thought, you know what? Uh, man, I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. And I, I, assert, uh, I uh, thank him for it. Daily assurance of our salvation. Search, uh, script, uh, uh, search the scriptures daily. Amen. <laughs> you know, get in God's word. Uh, what, what is it in um, Acts chapter 17 and verse, no, and verse number 11? It says, these were more noble than, than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. I like that, don't you? You know what that is? That you're looking or anticipating to get something. Readiness. Your mind's right. You know, I, I, I'll maybe tell them myself. I used to tell them my wife on occasion. I got in trouble. I don't tell them my wife. I tell them myself. <laughs> you know what? Uh, so you know, the idea that, you know, sometimes you open the Bible and you'll be thinking about something else. Something else is on your mind. And, you're, and you have it open and you're reading the words. But you know what? Your, mind, your mind's somewhere else. I, I, it may not happen to you, but it happens to me. And you know what I have to do? I have to stop, and I got to do. I got to get my mind right. I got to get my mind ready, looking, looking, anticipating something from God. You know, it's not just putting, it's not just uh, what do you call uh, putting the time in. <laughs> amen. Right. I don't know about you, but when I, <laughs> I want to make the time count. Amen. I don't want to just put the time in. I want to make the time count. Amen. You know what the idea, what do you say? A readiness, readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily uh, for, the, uh, for uh, whether those things are so. You know what? I told my folks, I said, yeah, check it out. I preached something. Take, take the, go home, take, take, your, take out your Bible and check it out. 
You got a question? Come back. I, I got news for you. I'm not afraid to say I don't know. I'm not afraid to say I'm wrong if I'm wrong. But I got news for you. You need to check it out on your. You have the daily assurance of your salvation by uh, checking the scriptures, by searching the scriptures, by surrendering to the Savior daily. You know what? We have a problem. We want to. We want to do it our way. You know why we've been bombarded, have we not, and especially in the last 10 years or so to make it focus on ourselves? That's always been a problem. It's a problem with kids. You know what? Kids are born with that nature. You know, it's all about them, what they want, you know, not, not caring about anyone else. And by the way, we need, we need to search our, uh, we need to surrender to the Savior every day. We need to yield to Him. You know what? A, a daily assurance of our salvation. How about soul winning? Being important real life. You know, I, I believe this. I said this last night, uh, yesterday, and it's so true. When we, what we have on our mind, if we got him in our heart, we need to have, get him on our minds. And if we have him on our, in our heart and our minds, guess what? We'll have him on our lips. We need to get God out there, amen? We have the opportunity. We need to get God, get God, you know, praise him and thank him. To a lost and dying world, he said, well, preacher, we, they won't listen many times if we start talking about the gospel. Well, then let's, let's acknowledge him and, and lift him up in every aspect that we can. The only way we're going to do that is to be thinking about it, amen, and thanking him daily. Yeah. Thirdly, a desire to, sem to assemble with the saints. You know, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't know. Maybe it's the time. Maybe, maybe one of you fellows in here could help me with this. I, it's just unbelievable how people say that they get saved and trust Christ their Savior and they have no desire to come to church and learn. Or come to church and be around God's people. I love being around God's people. Man, I'll tell you what, I look forward to getting together around God. I like getting together with people that believe the Bible. Amen. I get I like getting around people that, you know, uh, that talk about the things of God. Amen. You know, my, I, I enjoy after church sometimes stand, people standing around and, and, and talking about the things of God and how God's helped them and how God's blessed them and how God's working in their hearts and how, kids, how God's answering their prayers. You know, I like talking about God. Amen. Amen. I thought, you know what? The desire to come together. You know what? To encourage one another. Amen. You know what? The, the uh, number one question that I get asked on a regular basis is this. Where's so-and-so at? Yeah. They'll come to church after church. Hey, preacher, where's, where's old uh, Barry Scott at? Where's Scotty Allen at? And I got to tell you, you know what I tell him? I said, I don't, I'm not sure where he is today. Maybe you need to check on him. <laughs> you know, people say, well, it doesn't matter if I come to church or not. It's my business and I don't hurt anybody. I got news for you. When you're a child of God and you, and you claim to love Jesus and you want to want to be a vital part of the church and you don't show up, guess what? It hurts the church. Yeah. You know what? It hurts, it hurts the church. You know what? People, people are like, where are they at? Why aren't they here? You know, the idea of having a, to be an, uh, enthusiastic, I'm going to talk about it in just a little bit, but being enthusiastic and excited. But I'm not talking about something phony. Or fake. You know what? If you're saved, it's here. Stir it up a little bit. Amen. It's like a fire that's about better, about ready to burn out. Take the poker and poke it a little bit and get the flames going. Amen. Man, if it's there, don't put something on that's not real. Right. By the way, that's what that's that's what they do. I, we need to stir up what's real. Amen. I thought, you know, a desire, a desire to assemble with the saints. You know what? In your Sunday school class and worship service, take a part, man, and be a part of it. You know, participate. I appreciate, I appreciate this church. Man, I tell you what, you folks sing. Amen. I appreciate that. We was in a church a couple weeks ago. And what, more than half the people weren't singing. Like, what are you doing? Why? I wanted to say, what are you doing? And why are you here? You know? Yeah. I mean, I'm just like everybody else, try to help them going. But, you know, it's like, I encourage, you know, somebody said, well, I don't sing well. I said, well, you know what? Make a joyful noise. Do something. Be a, participate. Amen. And, and worship, worshiping him. You know, that's the way we do. We worship him with our, with our singing. We worship him with our, our godly living. We worship him with, with our giving. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. To, to have a desire to assemble with the saints. Well, you know what? That'll help you. That'll help you enjoy your salvation. Something camaraderie together, amen? The Bible talks a lot about um, unity, amen? Yeah. 
I mean, unity in the in the church, you know, to have a, a common goal to go do that which God would have us to do. How important it is. Back and be an influence in your church. Had someone recently come to church and they said, Preacher, I just don't feel like I, I just don't feel like I, I belong here. I just don't feel a part. I said, now, your kids are in 4-H, aren't they? They said, yeah, they're in 4-H. I said, now, if they would miss three out of four meetings in 4-H, do you think they'd show up and feel a part? She said, well, well, no, they would miss most of, the, most of the activities and they would miss most of the, of the teaching. I said, well, what in the world do you think that you can make one service out of the month and think you're going to be a part of something? Man, how foolish that is. And that's foolish thinking. And then, like, like they say down south, that's wrongheadedness. You know what I mean? Just wrong thinking, you know? I thought, you know, well, how can you be a part if you're not there? Or the famous last words, we, or the famous last words before they go out the door is, I just don't feel like I'm getting fed. You know? yeah. 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 Man, we put it out there whether you go up and eat or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You know, I got news for you. You can put it out there. It's amazing. You're preaching the same message to this side of the auditorium and this side of the auditorium. This side saying, preacher, I've grown more in the last three months since I've been here than any place else I've ever been. I'm so thankful for the preaching of God's word. Yeah. And over on this side, they're saying, I'm not getting fed. Now I got news for you. I, I believe it's in the attitude in which you come. I think it might go back to the attitude of readiness of mind or the willingness to learn. Amen. Yeah, right. The divine anointing of the Holy Spirit. The power to witness to the lost. You know what? I got news for you. We're, brother, uh, uh, brother, brother Mike and I were talking about this. The importance of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit and yielding to the Holy Spirit and praying. Yes, praying to the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I pray to God the Father, I pray to God the Son, and I pray to the Holy Spirit. Got news for you. I pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, we're not going to get it by just praying. The only way we can be filled is to empty ourselves. You know what? The Holy Spirit's there. The Holy Spirit will only occupy as much as we allow him to occupy. We need to empty out the self. I told the girls at lunch today, I said this. I said, see that ice in the water? That, uh, that ice is, uh, the water is the Holy Spirit. The, the glass is, is us. And by the way, the, the more ice you have in there, the less water you can put in. I said, the ice is us. I, 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 that ice is uh, our self. And you know what? As we empty our, <laughs> empty the, take the ice out, we can put more water in. I thought as we take the trash out, there's more room for the Holy Spirit. We start living and, and, and uh, uh, desiring the Holy Spirit to fill us and emptying ourselves of self and letting God work through us. Man, I want to I want I want to be I want to be spirit filled. Amen. I want to be spirit led. Well you know what we can't do the work without that. We need God's help. We need God's power to do God's work, you know. You know what? If we don't have it, we'll fail miserably. And we all know that's so. But we need divine anointing from the Holy Spirit. You know, when we need to pray pray for spirit uh be filled with the spirit and I thought you know what the power to work uh, to walk with the Lord the power to work uh, uh, in the spirit of, of love I got news for you I need help yeah. I need Holy Spirit help to love folks Amen. Right. next we see that to delight in the activities of service to enter in the ser service with gladness amen enter in with gladness you know, oftentimes we go through the motions and we don't do it, we don't do it with, the right, with the right motive and the right reason. We wonder why God doesn't bless. You know what? To delight. That word delight. To delight in the activities of service. Enter, enter into the service with gladness. Enthusiasm yeah. will give life to a service. Amen. Power to work. I mean, be excited about what God can do and is doing. Amen. Amen. Be excited about it. Man, look, look, stop and think. I love what your preacher said, talking about over his lifetime, how God's worked in his life. You know, I think about that. Boy, that encourages my heart. You know what? I, I say it often. I say it often when I'm going through a difficult time. God, you were, you, were for, you were with me back then, and you brought me through it, and you're with me now, and you're going to bring me through this. Amen. And guess what he does? He brings me through. Amen. When we apply the principles of God's word. You know, I was thinking oftentimes we pray for help. And when the truth of it is, we need to be obedient to what he's told us to do. 
You know, how many, <laughs> do you ever ask yourself, uh, you want a sobering thought, ask yourself the question, how many, how, many, uh, how many things in the Bible that I know that I'm not doing? Had someone, had someone talk, come to me not too long ago, younger person, they said, preacher, I'm, <clears throat> I want God to lead me and direct me. And I said to him, I said, well, are you doing everything you know you need to do? As God reveals it to you, do you do it? Well, there's, there's one thing I'm not doing. And he told me what it was. I said, well, <laughs> that's pretty basic. I said, I think maybe you need to start doing that. You know what? Once you start doing that, guess what? God will, give you, God will open your eyes or God will show you from Scripture what you need to do next. Right. Next step. You know what? I mean, I don't know about you, but brother, uh, uh, brother Mike, I'm sure when you had folks working for you and you, and you went out to the job and you said, do this, this, and this, and you came back at lunchtime and they hadn't done any of it, you didn't say, well, here's five more things to do. Right. You, you, know, you know what you would say to them, just like any boss would say? Why in the world haven't you done what I told you right. to do? Right. Well, you didn't give me anything else to do. <laughs> you know what? Many times when, when workers are that way, they're go, they go down the list to find things they want to do. And the, then the things they don't want to do, they put off. That's just how Christians are. They pick and choose. I don't like that. Give me something else. <laughs> Oh, I'm not, oh, I'm not willing to sacrifice that. Oh, I'm not willing to do that. I don't, I don't think that's necessary. Well, God's going to say, well, that's what you need to do. You need to, you need to take that next step. You need to do what I've told you to do. I'm not going to give you more to do when you haven't done what I already told you. By the way, what's the Bible say? He that, knew it to, he that knoweth to do good and doeth not is what? Sin. You know, we need to do, we need to do that which God has told us to do. We need to delight in the active service for, for him. Then lastly, we need to direct our accountability uh, d direct our accountability of the scripture over in Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 4 and uh, verse number 12 I believe it is it says oh the word of yeah yes the word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword right. uh, piercing even unto the divide and asunder but of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and marrow and and the, is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart you know what <laughs> We need to go to the go to the Bible, Amen. We look to the Word of God for your inspiration. You know what? We need to go to God to get inspired. Amen. You know what? We're looking for someone to inspire us. You know what? That someone's that someone's not a human being. That someone's God, Amen. You need to be inspired by God. By the way, don't misunderstand me. I'm thankful uh, for people that encourage you along the way. But can I tell you something? If you just look to people for to be inspired, uh, you're, there's going to be a day you're not going to be inspired. Right. You want to quit. You want to give up. Because mm -hmm. people disappoint you. Yeah. Just like we've disappointed people, by the way. Right. You know what? Look to the Word of God for inspiration. <laughs> Think about what you have in your salvation. I thought to, to inspire us. Amen. Sometimes I think of how unworthy I am Amen. and how worthy he is. Amen. Man, I get in the presence of God. And I just feel, man, I just want to fall, fall to my face and say, thank you. Thank you, God, for what you've done. I know what I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. And look at what you've done in my life. Amen. You know what? To enjoy that which he's given us. To enjoy it and take advantage of the opportunities that he has uh, put, uh, given us and bestowed upon us. Second, we see that we need to not only look uh, to the word of God for inspiration. We need to listen to the word of God for instruction. You know, I'm, <laughs> lately I just can't hardly get off this. You know, this idea that we need to follow what God's word says. I mentioned Sunday, I believe it was, about praying. You know what? We're using prayer for a substitute for obedience. I got news for you. We need to just, just think how effective prayer would be if we line ourselves up where we need to be, amen, as far as being, uh, uh, following what God's Word says. I look at it like this. I want to get myself uh, 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 under the, uh, the, the, the glory spout, amen, where the blessings come out. You know, look for the Word of God for inspiration. We need to listen, uh, listen, to, uh, listen to the Word of God for instruction. You know, God wants to direct us. God truly wants us to be successful in our Christian life. You know what? We need to look to Him. We need to listen to what He has to say. Then we need, then we need to learn, learn from the Word of God. The information that He has for us. 
and then take it and apply it to our lives. <laughs> Boy, take it and apply it to our lives. You know what? I want to enjoy the journey. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You know what I found out a lot of times when you're looking forward to something, and I'm looking forward to heaven. You mentioned this morning or today. You're looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to heaven. But I got news for you. I'm enjoying what, what I have right now. I want to make the what I have tech, uh, count, whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever, whether it be time, talent, treasure, whatever I have, I want to make it count for him. Amen. You know, I told my wife, I said, <laughs> I want to take all that we have and use it for God. Amen. And when this whole life is over, the only thing that's going to matter is what we've done with Christ and for Christ, right. what we've done with him and for him. That's all that's going to matter. How to enjoy your salvation. Realize what you have and thank him for it. Amen. And realize, hey, boy, I'm a child of the king. I'm joining heirs with Jesus. Amen. I get, to work, I get to work with him. I get to do the work. Amen. I'm so, I'm so blessed. Amen. By the way, we realize what we have. And there's so many, so much more. I just took some of the very obvious ones and talked about it. But you know what? We, we need to realize, uh, it says uh, the, the word of God, um, as far as... Uh, uh, he says uh, the, the ministry is for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying the body of Christ and that's what's about edifying him amen the body making the body of Christ to to, uh, to be more what we ought to be to, to bring honor and glory to him amen. say often it's not about me it's about him amen. amen and I thought what a wonderful opportunity we have take advantage of it amen. and you enjoy that which we have and it's not ever going to go away. I'm, I'm safe. I'm safe and secure. And, and nothing can separate me from the love of God. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm so, so thankful for what God has given me. I want to enjoy it. Amen. I take advantage of it. You know what? When, when you, <clears throat> we, just, we just need to think about it and thank him for it. And enjoy that which he's given us uh, now, today, right now. You know, one of the, well, one of these days. I got news for you. Let's. Let's, let's, let, let today be the day. Amen. Let's just stop and think what he's done and thank him for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunities that we have and the day and time which we live. And Lord, I think about how things have changed, and they surely have, and how dark this world is, and how, how corrupt it's become, and how perverted it's become, and how they're constantly trying to stomp out the things of God as it was sung in, in your word, as it was sung about tonight. And, but Lord, I pray you'd help us, Lord, to lift you up, and Lord, point, uh, Lord help us to point pe people to you. And Lord, may, we be, uh, may you be glorified in our lives, Lord, with a, with a cheerful attitude and, and enjoying, as we read in the scripture, enjoying that which you have for us. And Lord, that you purchased uh, for us, that you've sacrificed for us. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I pray you'd bless. Lord, help, uh, help us, I pray. Take that which was said and use it. Stir our hearts for you and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen.